Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance uh, YouTube channel and Conscious Resistance uh, website. So today we have Samuel Kovac, who is a Czechoslovakian who is currently living in um, Mexico. He's a Bitcoin specialist, um, lecturer, consultant, and blogger. And, um, and he's also got a great perspective on the, uh, the, the change between communism and, uh, you know, more free market capitalism. I guess you can't really say it's pure free market, but you can say it's <laughs> more free, right, than before. <laughs> so, um, so, Samuel, tell us, uh, maybe we'll start off with um, how you became an anarchist or a voluntarist. Uh, hi, yeah, well, you see, I think my... Uh, how uh, my change happened or how all this uh, all this happened was because uh, of my youth and how I grew up. I was growing up in Czechoslovakia under the communist rule and I saw how it didn't really work and how it wasn't uh, good for the people and then I, I thought maybe there has to be a change and the change really came in 1989 and I really liked it, and I decided this is what I want to pursue, the free markets, the freedom uh, for the people, for the ideas, and freedom of speech and all that. And I really like it, and I think that's, uh, that's how the world uh, should uh, function. And um, I, see, I see that, like, uh, how it's not working very well in some countries at the moment, how the rules are being enforced, and there are too many and uh, uh, strange, crazy rules. So I think, yeah, we should really uh, work on, on making the world uh, freer and uh, that's better for everybody. Oh, yes. So were, were there any, any books or personalities <laughs> that also influenced you? Uh, not, not really, not that I can recall. I'm uh, in this um, area, I'm more like a self-studied person. <laughs> you know, I studied a lot uh, on the computer, but it was more like a, like a revolt against what was going on in... Uh, in Czechoslovakia at that time, there were actually uh, many more people like me that they didn't like uh, the regime. Uh, very, very like a cliche or the thing, you know, that now is, uh, it seems really crazy, but it was really like that. In, uh, in Czechoslovakia, it was about the haircut. You, as a boy, you could only have short hair. If you like different kind of music, like uh, uh, metal or hard rock music, you still couldn't wear long hair because it was uh, prohibited. Wow. It, it was for girls. <laughs> so communists, they try to regulate a lot of aspects of your life. And people, you know, like me and other people, they were like, yeah, we have to do something else. We have to be opposite. This is crazy. So that's how I, uh, that's how I became an anarchist, really by trying to be against this, uh, this crazy system. I was too young to do anything, you know, special. I was 12 when it uh, changed. But, yeah, that's, that's how I started. I don't really think there was any special personality except for, like, the, you know, the revolt against the system. So, so who was the, the dictator at that time? Uh, well, in uh, Czechoslovakia, the president was uh, Husak. Mm -hmm. uh, it was his name. Uh, yeah, in, in Russia, it was a big country, our big neighborhood. You know the famous guy Stalin. Yeah, yeah. was the huge dictator. Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, it's a, it was a small country. Mm -hmm. uh, whole Czechoslovakia is 15 million people, so we were like, you know, just a small country in the Europe. But yeah, in our case, it was a president named uh, Husak. And, and so what changes did you see after the re revolution? Oh yeah, the change, it was a huge, uh, huge change. Uh, it happened on uh, November 17, 1989, when like the whole regime started breaking down. Uh, before there was only one party, the elections were rigged, of course, you got the Communist Party. Everybody had to be in a Communist Party if they wanted to get a good job or even a good school and all these uh, things that maybe many people are not aware of how it worked, but then it really came, uh, you can say, crumbling down from within the days, uh, there were elections, uh, new political parties uh, grew up uh, out of nothing, 
the whole economic system started to change uh, because of the, you know, how it was planned. Uh, I know if, uh, if you or any of your, you know, uh, readers or people that watch uh, these videos, if they've been to Cuba, because I think the people from US cannot really go to Cuba still, mm -hmm. but it was like still, it, it's in Cuba, you only had uh, certain kinds of uh, products, like in the States and now in Czechoslovakia and Slovakia, you have like hundreds of different sweets and uh, milk by 10 different producers with different uh, prices and all that. Before you get one kind of milk for everybody. So it was evil, one price, evil, evil capitalists, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, like, <laughs> it, was like, it was really like crazy. You got one milk and one price in all the stores. Wow. Like it's still in yeah. Cuba, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's a different different story. So and then it really changed. It was like you know for us it was like a different world. Well, what's we were wondering what's what's going on? You got all these products, you got all these uh, magazines, imported magazines from different countries. You could actually travel to different countries, like the Austria, Bratislava, where I lived, is just a few kilometers. You know we have a border. You could, we could see Austria when we were kids. We could see Austria, but we could not go hmm. because it was like the Iron Curtain. Hmm. So we could travel. We got all these products. And you could actually start a business. I was too young, but you could start a business uh, yourself. You could work on different ideas. Before, everything was controlled and everything had to be vetted by this, you know, communist uh, government. We got five-year plans and, you know, it's, it's for most people, it's maybe like, like from Mars or something. Yeah. But it was really crazy. And then it changed completely. But what was interesting that the change was like maybe too sudden and there were no rules. So uh, people that uh, had money, and it was very funny, people that worked for the communist government before and they were good connected and they got money, then they became the biggest capitalists overnight. <laughs> and with the same connections and with the same money, they, they made a lot of, lot of money because there were no real rules. So you could do whatever you wanted until, you know, the new parliament started to vote and we were looking how to privatize all the, you know, all the communist uh, factories and all that. It was really a crazy uh, time of a couple of years. Like, for example, the privatization, because it was like, okay, so it's everybody's uh, property. So you cannot give it to just one, you know, new capitalist. So there was this thing called uh, coupon privatization, where every citizen of Czechoslovakia got coupon book and could uh, buy, like, stocks in different previously government companies and they were supposed to like spread the you know the wealth between the people but who knew how it works there were just a few people who knew how it works mm -hmm. how the stock market works and all that so they made millions and the regular people they were like okay i got some some stocks how do i sell them what do i do so it was time like wild west yeah. time for all these entrepreneurs <clears throat> that you know were scamming the regular people that had no idea how the capitalism works mm -hmm. Wow. It was a crazy, crazy time of five, <laughs> maybe ten years. Yeah. Uh, nice that you could do what you wanted and uh, you were not, you know, spied on by the government all the time and all that. So, yeah. like, uh, some people, like, uh, for example, my wife, she has some relatives in U.S. They left in 1968 when the, there was this, like, kind of a revolt in Eastern Europe against uh, communists and Russia. But it failed. But many people escaped. And so if you had relatives in, like, you know, capitalist countries, you were being spied on twice, like twice that hard as other, mm -hmm. other citizens. So it was really crazy. So we were happy that this change happened. But then uh, looking in the retrospective, it was really like a wild west. You know, you got all these businessmen importing crazy things from all over the world, the Chinese um, staff came in and the prices were rigged. It was like, you know, there was no control of anything yeah. for a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, um, my mother-in-law, she's Hungarian. Right. And, and she experienced like a lot of communism uh, in, in uh, Romania and Hungary, I think, too. 
Um, right. And so from her perspective, and, and my wife also, you know, the first thing they say about communism is, you know, it was wonderful because there's no unemployment, right? Everybody has a job, right? And that's, right. that's the first thing when she came to this country. So he's like, why is there so many homeless people, right? Communism is wonderful. And then, and then I was thinking about that for a long time. And then only recently I, I, I realized that I think it's wonderful for those people who work for the government. <laughs> you know, yeah, but for, but... because there always has to be the, uh, you know, a private sector supporting the government, right? Because it, 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 well, I mean, that's my that's my feeling. Like, if you don't have any private sector at all, how can you have a government that's going to steal? It's like the host. It's like a parasite. It's like a parasite with no host, right? <laughs> well, in communism, you got uh, government and you got government companies. So everybody got job because you either you were working for government or you were working for government company. So in a way, it was nice. It was very good because. You didn't have like you know a government stealing from the people, you know, taxing them because it was all government. So, but then you got people stealing within the government and all that. But you didn't really didn't you know, it was it was kind of a crazy idea that you got a company that was supposedly paying the taxes to the government, but the company was government owned. So yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you so, were paying taxes to yourself. <laughs> yeah. So so what's weird about it is is that you know you, you have these um you know really oh. strict uh, communist regimes, right? Like uh, Soviet Russia and and Red China, right? And and they uh -huh. only lasted for you know a few years, maybe a decade or two, and then they just collapse, right? And they don't collapse. They don't end because uh, another country has invaded them, right? They end just because. They can't support themselves. Like, like they're they're not producing anything of value that people want to buy. You know, they can't. Maybe they're, they're not. Mm. Maybe they're controlling the farmers so much that the farmers can't even grow food to feed the population, right? So, so yeah, to or, me, that's it. That's that's what it seems like. Like, like how long? How long was the communism in in uh, Czechoslovakia? How long? Like, when did it start? It started right after Second World War. Yeah, like nineteen forty-eight. Actually, okay. when when it started, so it was like forty something years. Mm -hmm. But I think the main trouble was the there was no free market. Yeah. So the, you know the few people that were running the country basically they didn't know what's good for the people. They didn't know what's interesting for the people. They were just forcing it on you. Like, okay, you have to buy this because this is what we make. So I think the. The failure was no free market, no choice, no, you know, like the free market decides the prices and the supply and demand. Yeah. In communism, it was all planned. They yeah. said, okay, we have this many citizens, so we produce this much milk. Yeah. But, you know, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> so, so, so what do you tell people? crazy. What do you tell people when they, you know, you, you tell them that right after communism, there was a period of chaos where, where people were scamming each other and, and exploiting each other. You know, what do you say to, to people yeah. who say, well, that's anarchy. How can you be for anarchy? That's anarchy, right? <laughs> do, do you have people that, that tell you that? How can you be an anarchist? You're for exploitation and you're for, you know, <laughs> scam. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting, interesting question uh, that never really occurred to me. You know, the thing was, or basically what was happening in Czechoslovakia was that it wasn't really anarchy. It was like uh, you had people that were at the... Uh, they were still, you know, well connected and running the country and they were basically cheating. It wasn't like free market yeah. or liberty. Yeah, yeah. It was like, you know, I was, let's say, I was working for a government company. And now the government company was going to be privatized or sold to foreigner investors. But I was still the manager there. So I was, you know, looking for shady deals. I was selling the government property at different prices and all that. So you can say it was anarchy, but, you know, it wasn't anarchy for everybody. Most people were still following the rules mm -hmm. that were at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, some people, they say, well, nobody's enforcing them. So let's take advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, I, thi I think it, that's the difference still now in the, how the many countries work, that you have some people that don't follow the rules, and other people that follow the rules. So, yeah. but anarchy is that there are no real rules like rules, but it's it's free. So you decide on the price and your preferences mm -hmm. and all that. But still now you have rules for you know 
at least in Europe, you have rules for what you can produce, mm -hmm. how you can package it, and you know yeah. all this. And the big companies, they you know they lobby for the rules because they like them, and the small people, you know, <laughs> they have no influence. But it was it was mostly you know like I don't know like a wild west. Maybe that's that's different. I mean, mm -hmm. it was the rule of the strongest, yeah, yeah, which is not not what which is not what I really like. I think people should not oppress other people or cheat other people. I don't think that that's really anarchy or liberty. It was like like the rule of the strongest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When people tell me like, um, <laughs> you know, do you, if if there was a button that could turn, like that could completely, um, you know, wipe out government, like, in, you know, night and day, would you want to do oh, yeah. that? Would you do that, right? Oh. And, and yeah. I think that would be a horrible thing to do. Because for the same reason, in communism, in, in, in Czechoslovakia, it was a night, you said it was a night and day thing, right? It just changed. Oh, just very, a few days, yeah, really. Yeah, 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 very quick. It Week. Changed, yeah. yeah. So, so when people are used to a certain system over, de over many decades, you know, and then you have a, such a rapid change, sure, that could produce chaos. I can see how that could produce chaos and disorder. You know, and and right. panic amongst the people, right? It's like um, it's like saying, you know, if you have a religious empire, and then you murder mm -hmm. all the priests, and you know, and oh. uh, pastors, w would that produce an atheistic population? <laughs> of, cor <laughs> of, of course not, because because you know you're not affecting the minds of the people, right? And, and yeah, that's in, in, very in, good point. In, in anarchy and voluntarism, people have to understand self ownership, property rights, and you know, and the non aggression principle. You know, yes. for true liberty to um, you know take hold. So that's why it takes such a long period of time. You know, so you know, if <laughs> if if there was such a button to turn off government, I think it would be a horrible thing, <laughs> right? What do you think? Oh uh, yeah, I have to agree, and it's actually a very good point you're making because. It's like, yeah, the people are, they have kind of like a support structure. Oh, yeah. And I saw it in, in Czechoslovakia yeah. because they were used to how, how things work. And actually, like you said, some people really liked it. They had uh, food, they had a job, they actually had the government-sponsored house mm -hmm. or apartment. Mm -hmm. So it was great. And then suddenly it break down and nobody knew what to do. And then, you know, the people with connections and with a lot of money... Uh, yeah, it was it was kind of chaotic. Yeah, it oh, wasn't yeah. really. But like you say, also the thing is, people have to uh, have to change their perspective. They are, and maybe it may never really work because you always have people that like the strong hand. So when you start like some kind of anarchic, uh, you know, libertarian government or state. You still will have people that like to rule others, so mm -hmm. so it's kind of hard to do unless really people can understand it and can like it. Yeah, because yeah. you always like what I what we still see in Slovakia. You have people that really try to bribe the politicians and uh, try to uh, manipulate the elections and all that, uh, just because they like the power. They they really like to oppress other people and they like the power. They have to show they have the biggest car and the best house and one more house in Miami and all that. So yeah, it really takes the change in mentality. So, so and, and actually, it was like an experiment that happened in Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, when the regime fell. That it didn't really, you know, nobody was really ready for it, and it didn't go the peaceful anarchist way, but it went the way like the rule of the strongest. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, huh? So, so what was the reason that you that you moved to Mexico? Oh, uh, well, it's actually a, a personal reason. My father moved to Mexico twenty five years ago. Uh, so I always had connection with Mexico even uh, when I was younger mm -hmm. and uh, I was coming here for vacations and I really liked the people and the climate and all that and then we decided to come here with my wife uh, so it was like a personal reason but I think it was a good, uh, good decision because Mexico is really more open and free and you could say more anarchic country that, that uh, there are rules here of course, a lot of rules but they are not enforced that strictly and things uh, still work because people are, when people are peaceful and when they are nice. And most Mexicans are really nice and peaceful people. 
So just to give an example that I always tell to my friends in Slovakia, like, you know, the traffic rules. In Slovakia, it's horrible. There are fees for everything and points and all that. You know, it's very strict. But here you can go in, in a wrong direction. You can make an illegal turn. But you do, it, uh, you do it like because you are in trouble, you lost your way or something. And the police is usually nice. They understand it. Other drivers understand it. Because you're not doing it to harm anybody. You, you really... Uh, just want to get back and you, you don't want to drive another 10 miles yeah. to next legal turn, so you take illegal turn. <laughs> and you, you don't do it, you know, to, you know, to show that you are, you know, about the law. You do it for, like, very, very pragmatic reasons. And people understand it here. You're such a criminal. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's a nice country to live in, yeah. Cool, yeah. So, and so yeah, that's, that's my story, yeah. So tell me how you got into uh, Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin, yeah. You see, it all, all turns around these rules and regulations and the freedom and uh, anarchy, really. Uh, before, in Czechoslovakia, you, when you wanted to travel to other countries, you actually had to buy you know, dollars or other money from the government. And you had a limit. A certain limit. So when we wanted to go to vacations for vacations, to even Yugoslavia, which was part of the communist bloc, you had to have a permit to leave your own country and all that. So the money was really controlled. And the Bitcoin, it's again, it's like the opposite. It's like a revolt. It's really, you know, like uh, now we have sort of like a free market. So that's great. But we don't have free money. Money is so rigged and so controlled. It's it's terrible. So Bitcoin is like free money for everybody. And I really love the idea. And my background is computers and uh, also cryptography and economy. So it all, you know, mixes in Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin lives in the computer, in, in your cell phone. Uh, yeah, so I was really amazed that something like this could work. That you can have, it's called uh, uh, like a trust without third party. So... Before, you have to trust banks, you have to trust the government, but mm -hmm. then in Czechoslovakia or even now, you know, you trust the government to sell you just the correct amount of the foreign currency because there is a limit. You, they don't sell you more or you cannot transfer more, more money across the borders because government thinks it's dangerous. So, <laughs> but Bitcoin so is free. You can send, I can send you, you know, it's amazing. I can, I can send you now over the Skype, I can send you a million dollars in Bitcoin. Wow. Because it works We are, you know, scanning of the QR codes. So you show me your code, I scan it with my phone, and there it goes. And it's free, it's instant, and it's free in, in also, not, not that there are no fees, there are very little fees, but it's also free that nobody has anything to say about our transaction. It's our money and it's our freedom to do what we want. So it's like Bitcoin is that you don't have to trust anybody that they know what's better for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I really grew up hating that because the communists thought they know better for everybody and, you know, how it ended. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, just like, you know, I tell people a lot when I talk about the monetary system, you know, every, you know, our, uh -huh. our, our currency, the U.S. dollar, is a fiat currency that has no backing uh, at all. It's just completely, uh, you know, debt-based currency. And, right. and how many fiat currencies in the past have existed that are in existence today? <laughs> zero. <laughs> right? Right? Yes. All, of them, all of them have collapsed to zero. And why do we That's... think that the U.S. dollar is going to be any different? So what do you, what do you say to people when, uh, when you talk about Bitcoin? They say, well, well, look at the price of Bitcoin right now. What is it, $250? It was at $1,200. Now it's collapsed. It's just a bubble. It's just a bubble. It's a scam. <laughs> what do you say to those people? Ah, right. Yeah, that's the usual questions actually everybody's asking <laughs> and I'm glad you, you bring it up. Actually, the Bitcoin, one important thing is the Bitcoin works at any price, you know, because if, you want, if Bitcoin is worth $10, then uh, you just have to send more Bitcoins so that you send more value to somebody. So it doesn't really matter. But of course, if it's uh, widely accepted, there is limited number of Bitcoins which is a great thing compared to other monetary systems. It's like gold or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you, everybody can check how many Bitcoins are in existence at any moment. 
but they are a lot, very divisible, up to eight decimal points. But yeah, what do I say to these people? One thing is, um, it works at any price, and more people use it. Uh, the higher the price has to be because there is limited number of bitcoins. And of course, it's uh, it's a speculation, but it has been in a bubble uh, like three or four times. I saw it grow from cents to dollars, from dollars to uh, tens of dollars, from tens of dollars to hundreds of dollars, then fell back. So it has been going up and down. Of course, uh, you have speculators for everything. Um, Actually, it was a, an interesting story with, like, for example, with the iPhones, that you have people that buy iPhones in one place and sell them in another place. They use iPhone as a currency. Instead of traveling sure. with, with <laughs> money, you can travel with an, with an sealed new iPhone because you can always resell it for even more than what you bought it for. Wow. So, so people, people, but that's the, that's, I think that's the beauty of, the, of, the, of this anarchic system, that people always find a way uh, how to you know go around this, any any rules and any systems, and they you know they fine tune the system always like so uh, yeah always I mean the speculators like Bitcoin because there is not so much regulation so if you want to hold Bitcoin for a long time that that can be difficult to manage but of course um, now, if you want to use it for practical purposes, then it's very simple because you buy it um, here in Mexico and you sell it the same day in some other country or, you know, just uh, over a few days. So it works perfectly short time and as more people use it, the volatility will even because it will be more liquid. But you see, people say it's a, it's a bubble because the speculators like it, but the technology and the idea of Bitcoin, it doesn't depend on the price and it cannot be uninvented. It's going to be with us forever, regardless of the price, because it was invented. It's like Internet, you know. It's, you cannot say, well, no more Internet, we don't know. Because it's similar to Bitcoin in a way that Internet, you know, it's very hard to censor, very hard to regulate. And Bitcoin is the same and you cannot, you know, say no more now. Now it doesn't work anymore. It will work and it will be better and better over the time as people find out uh, the beauty of it, I yeah. think. Yeah. So just, yeah, don't, don't worry about the price. <laughs> if, uh, if you want to use it, you know, buy some Bitcoin, spend it next day, see how easy and uh, fast and secure it is. You know, I was I was just showing my wife the other day, like, uh, how do you pay with credit card? Okay, credit card number, direction, uh, expiration date, control date, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you give all this to somebody you never met yeah. because you want to buy something from them and you have to trust them that they keep it secure. Yeah. Paying with Bitcoin, you take out your cell phone, snap a picture of a QR code, and there it goes. Nobody has any information that they can lose or use against you or anything. And it's much faster. Mm -hmm. So it's just a question of time. Like we say in the Bitcoin community, uh, the better always uh, wins. The nature likes the way of less friction. Mm -hmm. So what's easier and faster is the future. I mean, the banks don't work on weekends. <laughs> I mean, they, they turn off the computers on the weekend. <laughs> if the computers, then there's nobody writing it on paper. Yeah. But they don't process things on weekends. Yeah, yeah. How crazy is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I find so, yeah, it, yeah, I find it really funny how um, a lot of these um, you know government institutions like um, you know like the post office, like libraries, and like banks, which banks are not really completely government, but they're you know heavily regulated. Um, but uh, yeah. you know, you just look at the hours, like you just said, uh, on weekends. You know, hours for the library. Like I was just. I just saw the, the hours for my local library. There's three hours they're open on Saturday and three hours they're open on Sunday. <laughs> and I'm like, if a private company decided to open only for only three hours on a weekend, how quickly would they go bankrupt, right? <laughs> like the weekend is the busiest no, time, Of right? course. Yeah. The weekend is the busiest. That's when nobody's working. Yeah, why, when people have free. Why would you want to not be open on the weekend? doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> so Yeah. No, it's that, like the Mexican banks, they close at 4 p.m., and most Mexicans, they stay in work until 6 p.m. But the banks, they close at 4. So what's the sense of having a 
bank, <laughs> you, you have to escape from your work to go to your bank. Exactly. Or have to go there on your lunch break or something. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I uh, explain Bitcoin a lot to my, my patients uh, because I'm, I'm an acupuncturist. I, I used to work in a, in my, in a clinic, a uh, car accident clinic. And, and um, Honestly. yeah, so I would talk about Bitcoin a lot with them because, you know, that's a little bit neutral. Like, you know, I don't really talk about anarchy specifically because that can be a little bit, uh, you know, um, how do you say, they get defensive if I mention anarchy. <laughs> so I, you know, I have to go back, yes. back to our message, like talk about the monetary system, talk about the Federal Reserve and things like that. And and so I describe uh, Bitcoin a lot to people uh, as digital gold, you know, because it's uh, yeah. it's very it's it's limited, right? It's scarce, and that's one of it, the beauty of it is. And uh, and the other thing, and the other thing people tell me is is you know it's it doesn't exist. It's on the computer. Anybody can hack it and steal your Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? And so that's another reason why people don't trust it. So what would you say to those people who say you know it's just, it can just be hacked? What, what would you say to those people? Well, there is there is a thing that most people, unfortunately, they have hard time understanding with the Bitcoin, because Bitcoin it's it's a network uh, like a technology, it's a network of thousands and thousands of computers that work together and uh, like secure the Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin network, and these thousands of computers they run this uh, software and they have never been hacked. The software is open source, so it's not hidden. You can look at how it works. So you don't have to try to hack it. You can re actually read through the code and try to find the problem there. You don't have to, you know, uh, be sneaky and try to hack it. But nobody was able to do that. Actually, there are people that are improving it over time. But nobody was able to find any flaw in the, in the main system, which is based on uh, years and years of research and cryptography and computer systems. What, what, what is being hacked, of course, are the companies like you had this Japanese company Mount Gox that were securing the bitcoins for you you trusted them with your bitcoins because you wanted to trade in them but it wasn't like the bitcoin failed the company failed because somebody maybe inside work maybe some hacker hacked the company but they never hacked the bitcoin itself the bitcoin are still secure and working but this company didn't do its work properly so what I tell to the people to make it short is like you know somebody hacks Chase Bank does that influence the dollar is the dollar less secure no just one bank didn't do its job properly yeah. so uh, it's, it's actually the same somebody steals gold from some vault is the gold less secure no the gold you still <laughs> cannot um, fake the gold really well you can but you, obviously you'll find out that it's fake gold mm -hmm. so you cannot create gold out of thin air yeah and no so it's it's the same bitcoin works really really well uh, but some companies they don't know how to work so you know you can steal credit cards just as you can steal bitcoins but it's not the problem of the bitcoin it's problem of how how different companies secure it yeah uh, yeah, so that's the difference people don't understand. They say, well, Bitcoin has been hacked. No, the exchange has been hacked or somebody stole Bitcoins from you know, a company, but Bitcoin works very yeah. well. Yeah, and it's funny when I, I, I talked about Bitcoin to some of the people and you know, they, they know about it because they hear it on the news occasionally. Oh, yeah. And then, and then you know, when the Mt. Gox um, you know, thing happened, uh, my patients came in and they and they say exactly what you said. Bitcoin was just. Did you see in the news? Bitcoin was just hacked. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I, and I had to explain uh, just like what you said. You know, if 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 a thief, um, you know, robs a bank, is that the problem with the currency or the problem with the bank? Right. With the bank, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. people have to. Uh, you know, that's that's our job is to dispel these um, myths, right? Myths, yeah. And, and, and I'm. Really sorry. I'm really sorry that the most media they do a very poor job explaining all this. It improved uh, recently, but before it was all these stories like, yeah, the Bitcoin was hacked, because the media can, you know, they can word the article differently, so that it it's really clear that it's not Bitcoin, but just some random company in Japan. But they worded it. They made it sound like, oh, this is the end of Bitcoin. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and I think um, I think it was China and Thailand that uh, are the only two countries that have banned it. Do you know about that? 
Uh, uh, yeah, well, actually, China didn't ban it because you have a, quite a few Bitcoin exchanges in China. Oh, really? <laughs> the, yeah, the legal situation in China, in, in the world around Bitcoin is, is changing really fast. Okay. There is a website that's called BitLegal. I don't know if it's .net, I think. Well, you can find it on Google. Uh, BitLegal. And they try to compile the news from all over the world regarding the legality. But it has been made illegal, I think, in Thailand and I think in some South uh, American country. Really? Most countries, they don't care. But it's, it's what we say in the Bitcoin community, again, is the, uh, the governments, they, they fear Bitcoin because it's very open and it's very secure and very transparent. So it's, it's a competition to shady government businesses, you know. So they ban it. There is even a joke. Uh, going on like whatever Russia tries to ban on China tries to ban get into it it's the future because <laughs> Russia and China they are afraid of the future so whatever they ban that's the future <laughs> yeah I mean you know apply that to, to, to the US to I guess most countries you know whatever they ban you know get into that um, but but yeah the IRS I think um it declared Bitcoin as property right uh yes in the states anyway yeah that's so, correct. So what are the implications of that? I'm not quite sure. You know, I don't follow the U.S. Uh, rules much. Okay. I think there are some uh, tax implications or how, on how you can you have to tax uh, Bitcoin price-wise. Like, for example, you buy Bitcoin at $100 and then you sell it because you buy something with it or just sell it at 500 So it counts as a property, you know, buy and sell it doesn't count as a currency buy and sell and there are different rules on the tax on your profit you know on the difference but how are they gonna how are they gonna track you like how are they gonna know that i guess it's up to the person <laughs> to admit it right to admit that you did that, that uh basically yes you see you have companies like coinbase for example that hold your bitcoins for you they are called like Bitcoin Bank, basically, because they hold the Bitcoins, but they want a copy of your ID and all that. So, you know, if you have a lot of movements that you don't uh, declare, they can report you to the government oh my agency. God. Really? Because they, oh. because they hold your Bitcoins and they are based in the U.S. law, so they have to track your transactions. It's like the bank can report yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the beauty of Bitcoin is that you can download, like you did, you can download your wallet, uh, you don't have to give your personal information to anybody and you don't have to report your transactions to anybody. But you have to hold your Bitcoins yourself. If you trust Bitcoins to some other party that is based in U.S. law or European law, they have to follow the law, of course. So that's like, yeah. <laughs> so so what's the difference between um, holding, like, um, like you can hold your Bitcoin on a website, which is not really a bank, like like blockchain.info. Like I'm not I'm not holding my wallet. My wallet's not on my computer, right? It's on this in this website. Is, is that correct? Uh, actually, yeah, it, it's a it's a little confusing. Uh, basically, blockchain is like a cross between a bank and and the the Bitcoin, like holding it yourself. If you download a software to your computer or your cell phone. Then you hold your bitcoins yourself. If you use Coinbase or Circle.com or somebody like that, then they are your your bank because you don't you trust them with everything. And blockchain is like uh, intermediary blockchain that info because uh, they uh, you hold your own like bank keys. Uh, how can I explain it easily? They encrypt the information. But they don't see your password. They can never recover your password. Mm -hmm. If you notice, there is no password recovery option on their website. Mm -hmm. So they cannot, uh, uh, you know, you, you hold your bitcoins. They are like an intermediary. Because if, you know, the bank can recover your password, uh, Coinbase can recover your password. So they have access to your bitcoins. But blockchain cannot recover your password, so they cannot access your bitcoins. So it's like a crossover. The ideal thing is download open uh, source free software to your cell phone and hold your bitcoins in your cell phone or in your computer. There is no intermediary then. But the blockchain is convenient because you are on a website, accessible from any computer. But uh, yeah, if you lose your password, they, they cannot recover it for you. So it's safer than 
than email or a bank because you know bank has access to all your funds. So and, blockchain, yes. And what's and what's an example of uh, of some websites that that where you can get the software to download onto your computer? Oh, the easiest thing really is to go to triple uh, w bitcoin dot org. It's a website uh, made by Bitcoin Foundation, mm -hmm. and they have uh, select they have a part of the website that gives you selection of different Bitcoin wallets, and they explain which ones are based in your computer, which ones are open source. They explain the differences. It's really a great site, bitcoin.org, uh, made by Bitcoin Foundation. Uh, I really recommend it, a lot of uh, videos and reading materials. Uh, yeah, because there is quite a, in the recent years, quite a competition in Bitcoin wallets. Before there were two or three, now you have 10 or 20 different Bitcoin wallets. Uh, from different countries, you even have like a, it's called a hardware wallet, that it's like a small USB stick, but it's not a USB stick, it's actually a small tiny computer that holds your bitcoins, and you plug it in the computer, make a payment, and unplug it, so, you know, it cannot be hacked, because it's not connected to the internet. Nice. So, it's really growing really fast, but for some, for most people, it's maybe too confusing, so they like... Websites like you said, blockchaininfo, circle.com, coinbase.com, which looks like email. You don't see much difference. It looks like email mm -hmm. uh, for most people, like, for example, Coinbase. You actually type an email address and send the bitcoins to an email address, like you would say, send email. Mm -hmm. And if the other person already is a Coinbase user, they get the bitcoins. If not, they can sign up or they can forward the bitcoins to their own computer. Mm -hmm. For most people, yeah, maybe they prefer this kind of third-party services, but, you know, it's, you have to trust the third party. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. If you want to do it yourself, it's getting easier and easier because the programs are getting better and better. So, so um, I assume you're also following the Ross Ulbrich trial, the, the Silk Road? Oh, a little bit, yeah. So, I mean, the so what, are your, what, are your perspectives, what are your perspectives on that, your opinions? The, yeah, the whole thing is crazy. I'm more, you know, liberty inclined, of course. Uh, this guy, he was uh, facilitating, you know, uh, online trade in illegal and legal things. It's, it's a myth that Silk Road was only for illegal things. It was for anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was outside of government uh, site, so most people used it for illegal things. But it was for anything and everything. So he was a libertarian, he's a libertarian and uh, anarchist because he was just facilitating a free trade. Uh, I don't think it was his, uh, how would you say, I don't think it was his intention to steal or harm people or whatever. So I think it's, it's, it's like maybe a too much what's going on. It's like, you know, you still have drugs and illegal sales all over the world on the streets. And it's more dangerous. Actually, uh, Silk Road was uh, safer for the buyers and sellers because they didn't have to meet in person in some shady place. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, but of course, I think yeah, it's like you know, it depends on your view of the government and the policies. I think that you know, it was like the prohibition of the alcohol in the states earlier, you know, 20th century. Who did it help? It only helped to grow mafia. Like the drug prohibition grows mafia in Mexico because they make more money. When it becomes legal, there is not so much profit margin. Mm -hmm. And people will buy it if it's legal or not, they will buy it anyway. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, I think it's too much what they are doing, but well, it depends if you like the government policies. Some people may be more uh, communist inclined and they may say, yeah, we have to kill all the drugs. So where do you draw the line? Is alcohol a drug or is tobacco a drug? Maybe chocolate is addictive. I don't know. <laughs> so it, my wife, my wife would argue that one. She's yeah, <laughs> I keep chocolate away from my wife. <laughs> so it really depends how you view the government. But I think it's it's too much. I'm really more uh, free-minded, and I can see it in Mexico that uh, I would say because the drugs are illegal here, that's what makes a lot of money for the for the mafia here. You know, like it did with the alcohol in the States. But of course, if you live in a country that you have to follow the laws of the country where you live in. So, yeah. 
Ross Ulbricht was not declaring taxes. He was uh, facilitating the sales of illegal substances according to U.S. law. Well, now the marijuana is not anymore illegal in some parts of the U.S. So what do you make of that? I mean, the laws change. So, yeah, yeah, like the alcohol was illegal. If I'm right, it was illegal in the States a uh, hundred years ago or less than hundred years ago. Well, yeah. now it's not illegal. So what's, yeah. what's right or what's wrong? It depends on the, you know, <laughs> on the time and place, I guess. <laughs> yeah, what was, what was funny, I, I tell this story a lot to people, is um, you know the the insanity of man-made law is um, I think it was like in nineteen around nineteen thirty two um, nineteen thirty three well nineteen thirty two is like um, alcohol was illegal and gold was legal <clears throat> to hold right okay and then the next right. the very next year <laughs> no kidding alcohol yeah. is legal and gold is illegal to hold. <clears throat> Right? The complete right. opposite. <laughs> and, of course, it's all for the benefit of the people, of the citizen. Of course. The whole <laughs> point is that it's for our protection. <laughs> and because we are the government, right? We control the government. <laughs> well. <laughs> we are the government. Don't worry. If anything, if, if we do anything wrong, it's because you wanted us to, right? <laughs> well, see. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but you know you, you talked about the Mexican drug cartels um, because that's one that's one thing when I tell people how wonderful uh, you know a place to live for example Mexico is that's the first thing they say what about the drug cartels it's so dangerous people get you know dying all the time over there it's so it's you know so much crime but what would you say to those people right well um, it's not so bad uh, actually because we also do you know this travel business. And we bring tourists here, and they they ask the same things. Mostly, the drug cultures they they kill each other. They don't worry about the regular people. There are some kidnappings of you know of the rich people, so they get more money from the ransom and stuff. But they don't care about the regular people. They uh, yeah. So if you you have to be in the wrong time, wrong place, so to speak, to be in a trouble with the drug cartels. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, you want to avoid certain areas that are known for drug cartels or things like that, but it's not like they would go after you and try to rob you or kill you. They really uh, try to move the drugs around and push them to the states. They, they don't, you know, uh, bother regular citizens or tourists. Mm -hmm. For tourists or foreigners, it's even better, I have to say, because... Uh, because of being foreigners, you know. Imagine there is a news that some U.S. citizens were kidnapped or killed. That brings a lot of trouble to the country. And the uh, drug cartels, like you would say, like paras parasites, so they don't want to kill the whole country, mm -hmm. the whole host. They want it to, so it seems okay. They don't want, you know, to be all over the news and, you know, yeah. have the government uh, sending troops and military all over. They, yeah. they are... They are not smart enough to to be to stay low. They sometimes they just have to have a shooting uh, midday, you know, really? somewhere. Oh. Uh, it has happened, not not often, but it has happened. So mm -hmm. they they should be more more <laughs> quiet, I guess. <laughs> you, should, you should give them some consulting, some words. <laughs> you should get, get some uh, suggestions on how to be uh, more inconspicuous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, <laughs> but it's really, I have to say, it's it's not as bad as the as the media make it. And, and of course, you have shady areas in any country, in any city. So yeah. you just avoid the bad areas and you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just like, kind of like how dangerous is Harlem or, you know, or, uh, you know, maybe Brooklyn at, at a certain time of the night, you know, it's like, <laughs> sure, yeah. you have ghettos, you have slums and you have... You have uh, you know shady people everywhere you go, right? Like, just yep. you, you know everybody knows those places. So why would you go there, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's the whole point. Yeah, and they really don't, you know, they mind their own business. But sometimes, you know, you just happen to be in the wrong place. So yeah, 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 <clears throat> yeah. Well, all right. So I don't want to take up any more of your time. Uh, so why don't you let people <laughs> know where where they can find you? Any websites or Facebook pages or anything like that? Ah, uh, sure, yeah. Well, I really highly recommend, again, the website uh, bitcoin.org for anything Bitcoin-related. 
Uh, me, myself, I'm on uh, Facebook under Semi Kovac, S A M Y K O V A C, Semi Kovac, on uh, Facebook. Uh, I work for myself. I don't really have uh, a business website uh, that I can, uh, uh, people can um, visit, but they can easily find me uh, by my name or anything. You see, the Bitcoin thing is more like person to person or, you know, word of mouth. That's an interesting thing. You don't have like a company that's called uh, Bitcoin Inc. that would, you know, uh, promote Bitcoin. Everybody promotes like themselves. Coinbase promotes Coinbase. Mm -hmm. uh, BitPay promotes BitPay. So it's like, you know, you don't, nobody promotes dollar. Everybody promotes, okay, we are JP Morgan, we are Chase. So it's the same with Bitcoin. I promote uh, myself. I'm here in the Lake Chapala area. So anybody can just, you know, uh, get in touch with me on uh, Facebook or, or whatever. And I'm, I'll be happy to help them with anything Bitcoin related. Uh, and really the great uh, resource is bitcoin.org to anything Bitcoin related, open source, free. You can read and watch videos. Yeah, there, there's no cost. Anybody can, you know, play with it. Yeah. So, so do you have a website, samikovac.com or, or something? Uh, no, I'm on, uh, I don't have like a business website or anything. Uh, I'm on Facebook oh, just under Facebook. Semi. Okay. Okay. Under Semi Kovac, I sell bitcoins on different Mexican exchanges, which are public, like Unisent, uh, like uh, Bitso.com, like MaxBT.com. Hmm. I'm also a trader on LocalBitcoins.com. That's the beauty of Bitcoin. People ask me. That's another question <laughs> to answer, maybe, or just quickly. Uh, Say, people ask, well, so it's like a Ponzi scheme, right? So you sell me bitcoins and you keep my money. And then I sell bitcoins to somebody else. It's like a pyramid, right? And you are on the top because you are the first in the area. It's like, no, forget it. It's, 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 not, it's like gold. Yeah. You can buy bitcoins from me, but I don't have any monopoly. You can buy bitcoins from anybody who sells them. Yeah. Okay, they say, okay, that's interesting. And where do we sell them? Do we have to find you? What if you disappear? What do I do with the bitcoins if you disappear? I say, come on. You can spend them on, on overstock. You can, you can buy... No, you, should tell them, you should tell them, if I disappear, they're useless. I'm sorry, you know, you, you, you lost <laughs> yeah. your money. <laughs> So it's really open. Anybody can talk to me, but they can talk to hundreds of other people in Mexico. But I'm, you see, I live in this area, like Chapala area, so maybe I'm like the best choice here uh, because, you know, you don't want to do it on, on a distance. So, yeah, I'll be happy to help anybody with Bitcoin. I'll be also in Acapulco on this Anarcapulco conference. Uh, I'll be doing lecture here later maybe in uh, in a month in this area so yeah Very good. Uh, yeah it's all it's all on the internet free awesome. and uncensored information <laughs> that that anarchic chaos of internet that we all hate right <laughs> <laughs> nobody likes the internet there's no laws there's no rules to the internet we need rules <laughs> so 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 is there any any last uh, message you want to leave the listeners before we before we go uh, yeah, well, I'm really happy to be on your show. I really like what you are doing for the people. It's very important to spread the message. It's uh, this, uh, this era we live in is, is the era finally of free information that people ha can have access to information they need. Uh, yeah, so that's one message. And maybe another message is take a look at the Bitcoin. Uh, it's really simple, easy, and you'll be amazed how... Uh, how could how could you live with the current banking system? It's it's a comparison of to the letters and the email. That's the comparison to the current banking system and Bitcoin. Uh, it's it's not you don't have to understand the technicalities. Just give it a try. I mean, look at the, look at the Skype. We can do interview of, in different parts of the world. And how does how does Skype works? Who understands how it works? Exactly. Well, I even I don't understand it perfectly. <laughs> And I'm involved in all this technology. So don't worry if you don't understand Bitcoin. Just try it out. Try it out. Skype is just too expensive. All those long distance fees, you know. I just uh, this this call is costing me how much money? <laughs> right? Yeah, that that that's exactly what Bitcoin is about. Yeah, it's it's the money for the internet and internet for the money. 
it's the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I tell people that. It's uh, it's like, you know, what mail is to email, you know. Actually, that's one thing I tell people when they say, but Bitcoin doesn't exist, right? How can you how can you tell me that I'm buying something and it doesn't even exist? Like at least money I can hold in my hand, paper, you know, right, or coins. Right, right. But but I, I tell people, so so does that mean that email is useless because you can't hold email? You know, it doesn't exist. Is it that mean it's useless, right? <laughs> of course not, you then, know. <laughs> then it goes some people would say, like they say to me, Well, but you can print the email. You can print the email, you can hold the paper. Mm -hmm. And I say you can print the bitcoins. You can print your bitcoin codes from your computer mm -hmm. and you can hold them. You can even put them in a safe so nobody steals them. You can print out your bitcoins actually. Yeah, of course, you can spend them online, but you can print them out. And, and what and what are those coins? You always <laughs> see the coins, uh, you know, that people have a Bitcoin. What, right. what is that? Yeah, the coins. That's actually, you know, Bitcoins. They are like uh, codes, you know, access codes to the Bitcoin network. You uh -huh. can say, but the coins, uh, they hold the different uh, numbers and codes. So it's it's just a place where you write it down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then when you type it back into the computer from this coin, you can spend it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like a you know like a like a funny thing like a coin. Yeah. But you can't do anything with it. It just uh, hides or holds the actual code. Yeah. To spend your bitcoins. Yeah, but many people like it because they can hold it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't think people will take bitcoin seriously until they see. Oh, it's a coin. Okay, I can see the coin now. That's good. Okay. <laughs> now it's real. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how people need time to adjust to new things. Yeah, I know. But that's, you know, that's I mean, just how it is. I mean, without slaves, who would pick the cotton, right? I mean, you know, we need the slaves to pick the cotton, so we can't have a, a society. <laughs> how can we have a society well, without dollars and cents? You know, we always had dollars and cents, right? <laughs> Well, we only remember dollars and cents, but you know, hundred years ago or two hundred years ago, there was no dollars. So. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, people. That's that's what that's what learning about monetary history teaches you is that you know, um, you know, currency, especially government-controlled currency, is just disastrous. You know, and just destroys yeah. the middle class and uh, robs the middle class basically of their wealth. Yeah, and people yeah, I've seen to, it happen. You know, people have to understand that. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for the uh, the opportunity for the interview, Sammy. Uh, thanks to you also. It was great. Yeah. Hey, you're welcome. So, um, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>